wine, oxygen. Are they besties? It's time for Pocket Wine School. Now, you've seen someone at your dinner table pop the cork on a big red, and before anyone else can touch it, they slap your hands away. It needs to read, they tell you, leaving everyone else at the table tragically unbuzzed for the next 30 minutes. Or maybe they decide not to wait and pour that first glass. By glass number two, they might declare, man, this baby has opened up, which is only appropriate for wine drinkers and infant cardiologists to say. This might be you, or perhaps you are someone who doesn't notice a terribly large difference, but you nod along in solidarity, afraid of appearing unsophisticated. Who's right? Well, it's complicated, but not that complicated. Giving wine a chance to rest outside the bottle isn't a new concept. In fact, it was once considered to be absolutely crucial. I'm sure you're familiar with the sulfite generating element sulfur in wine, and if not, there's a very handsome video about it right here. Years ago, it was very important to expose the wine to air before drinking it. But this was mainly to let the sulfur aromas dissipate. What does sulfur smell like? Well, if you've ever smelled a rotten egg, or if you've been a rotten egg because you were the last person to do something, then you've smelled that sulfury smell. Nowadays, sulfur levels in wine are very tightly regulated. Back in those days, not so much. The good news was, and is, that a little fresh air lets those aromas, often called reductive aromas, leave the wine so that you can drink without vomiting, at least this early in the evening. In this instance, a little fresh air will do your wine some good, but not so fast, it can also do your wine some bad. See, oxygen, despite being one of my favorite things to breathe, is actually pretty destructive to living things in certain amounts. Like with everything, the poison is in the dose. Louis Pasteur, who you'll remember from sixth grade science, played a much bigger role in modern wine science than you might be aware of. Twas he who discovered the microscopic organisms that devoured sugar. Twas he who observed their role in converting sugar to alcohol, carbon dioxide, and heat. And twas ye who named them yeast. And twas he who realized that oxygen does a real nasty job on wine and many other things. When something rapidly oxidizes, we have a name for it, fire. When something organic slowly oxidizes, we call it rotting. When something inorganic slowly oxidizes, you may refer to it as rust, although if it's under 12, it often goes by rusty. And though oxygen helps us stay alive, it's also killing us by causing our cells to replicate improperly. This is why it is important to eat your fruit and vegetables, people. They're chock full of antioxidants. Pasteur was asked by Napoleon III, he who gave us the famous Bordeaux classification of 1855, to figure out why wine went bad when it was being shipped. Pasteur's answer, too much oxygen, but he qualified it. Small amounts of oxygen seem to improve the wine. And where was this small amount of oxygen coming from? Ullage, which in a wine bottle is the space between the cork and the liquid. When a wine benefits from aging, and this is the case for way fewer wines than you think, it's because of this exposure to a small amount of air in the bottle and nowhere else. That's right, corks are airtight, so you can stop sticking your nose up at screw caps and synthetic corks. Unromantic though they are, they are actually quite badass. Now, it's important to note if you feel like your wine has really opened up by the second glass, it's certainly possible. It's a little more likely that the wine hasn't opened up. You have, courtesy of our good friend alcohol. The question is, given the tricky relationship of oxygen to wine, are you damaging or helping by exposing it to air? Well, let's clear something up right away. By simply uncorking the bottle just to let it breathe, you are doing what the ancient Egyptians called jack squat. Simply put, there's not enough surface area being exposed to oxygen. But what about decanters and aerators? Well, they're crucially important. If you ask the people who sell decanters and aerators, if you ask the people who have to back up their assertions, not just with limited studies, but with the preponderance of data, the answer is closer to, in maybe a few situations, but usually no. The reason for this is that sometimes wines are made from certain grapes that have high levels of tannins. Those are those things from grape skins and seeds that dry out your mouth. Oxygen can help soften those tannins, but only if the wine was exposed to oxygen while it was being made. Otherwise, you're probably doing more harm than good. 
In other words, if you're decanting your $15 Pinot Noir or Gamay-based Beaujolais, two grapes with mostly low tannins, or if you're aerating a wine that was made in stainless steel or concrete instead of oak, you may be doing more harm than good. However, if you are drinking an oaked, good quality Cabernet Sauvignon, Nebbiolo, Sangiovese, Syrah, or Monastrel, and a sip of it makes your mouth dry out like a salted slug, you can let it sit a bit. Now, if you want to serve your favorite wine in a pretty, pretty decanter, or if you want to show off your newfangled aerator made out of hollowed out walrus tusk, you can, by all means. And a note about decanting aged wines. Yes, you should do it, but for a much shorter time than you think. The older a wine gets, the more fragile it becomes. Letting that oxygen at it will likely just make it fall apart. And that's the story of letting wine breathe. If you enjoyed this video, you may like this other video about butter and Chardonnay. And if you want tons more videos showing you what to learn and what to unlearn about wine, subscribe. And as always, rock out with your corks out.